glory. Thank you. Be seated if you would, please. It's sure a blessing to be in God's house. I trust each one of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. How many folks enjoyed Thanksgiving? How many of you had your family here? How many of you ate too much? All right, good. I guess I better say a word about first time I've ever come in church. No, it's the second time I've ever come in church with a crutch or crutches. And I pulled a muscle in my upper leg right here, contrary to what the men told me when I came in. I got healed on that one, brother. I don't need it. I think the other one's gone. So, But uh, the men told me when I came in and said, if I had obeyed her, I'd have come out okay. And uh, you know how men are. And uh, I need to say this. June is here today with me, and I thank God for that. And, you know, uh, for Friday and Saturday, she was a cook, a nurse, a comforter, a chauffeur, and I could keep going. And so, and it even looked like she enjoyed doing it. And I need to say something to you. I thank God for the privilege of having a great wife. I really do. And I mean that with all of my heart. And uh, on February the 3rd, this is hard for me to make an announcement or to believe. I don't believe it myself, but I'll go on and share it with you. On February 3rd, it will be 55 years. Is that right? 55 years. And uh, uh, we were both about two and three years old when we got married. And everything's been all right since then. It's been, been a blessing. It really is. And let me say a word about Brother Arnold. When Brother Arnold came up, and I just, uh, I've gotten to know his heart a little bit, got to know the way he and looks at it. And, and uh, he and I have shared a couple things together. And I thank God for the deacons of this church. I thank God for the privilege that I've had to be a very, very small part of transition, and it's such a blessing to look at the staff and see what God has done, and to be able to stand here and to know, for you to know as a member of this church, that the attendance has been great, the offerings have been great, and people have been saved, and uh, planning-wise, everything is on schedule right now for this church to just, not to just day by day to move into 2017, but everything's on schedule for this church to launch into 2017. You'll find that out in the next two or three weeks. Having to do with the search for a pastor, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, getting a preacher sometimes, kind of like a guy wanting to get married. It really is. You know, a guy gets a certain age and he says, you know, uh, he starts looking around a little bit. Getting a preacher's like that, and you get a little anxious sometimes. And uh, it's very normal for that to happen in a church, but this church has done quite well. The process will be complete at our deacons meeting this Wednesday night as far as the deacons being completely in line with everything it takes to be set forth in the process of forming a pulpit committee to find the next pastor. At your annual meeting, second Wednesday night in December, uh, you can expect some real positive things to be said about that. And uh, it just I've never seen so many things move so fast and so well. It's been a wonderful thing. So it's been a privilege to be here. I need to say something else also. Several people asked me about, in the area of soul winning, most of you know that we deal a lot in soul winning material, and if we'd put some soul winning material on tables, soul winning Bibles, and we did that in the back, and I threw on some of these uh, uh, subject Bibles that are at the back back here, and lots of people say, well, what is it all about? Several years ago, I had the privilege of being part of a team that put together a subject Bible, which means it's two Bibles in one, you have the King James Bible from all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And then you have Bible number two, two complete Bibles. You say, why do you have two? Because in Bible number one, what you've got is at the bottom of every page, you've got a number on that page. If you turn in Bible number two to find that number, what you're going to find is the same verse, but every other verse in the Bible that deals with that subject. For instance, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 will have a page no number, you turn to that page, you'll find every verse in the Bible on creation. Not only the verses, but it'll be put together in subjects or in topics. It's one of the greatest Bible subject things. I've used them for years. Recently, they put it together in one volume, and they called me when they said they was going to do so and wanted me to order some in advance, and they were going to put it in Italian leather, and it is brown on the bottom and black, beautiful, and then they put together a wonderful DVD on the history of the Bible. Everybody needs to have one of these. You need, your children need to know where the Bible came from. In fact, you need to know where the Bible came from. 
A lot of people have died. A lot of blood's been shed so we could hold this Bible up. Amen? And we need to know the history of the Bible. So they put this together, and they wanted me to put them in our crusades, $139, and they put them on television. And I said, I don't think I can do that. And um, I'm sure it was, you know, from their standpoint, worth it. And about a year and a half went by, and they called me, and they said, we want you to have these in your meeting. How much would you sell them for? And I said, $59. And they said, we can't do that. And I said, well, just keep selling them, right? About six months later, they called me back and said, we put 500 aside that you can do that with. And so that's the reason that Bible's on the table back there for $59. It is a great value, and this comes with it free. So if you're interested in that, it's a great Christmas gift and other things. We have a limited amount of those. That's what that Bible's all about. And I say that because one of the greatest things we could do today is study the Word of God. Now, if you, if you want a Bible to study the Bible, that's a good one. If you just want a Bible to carry around that, and you're not going to use it, that's not the Bible to buy. <laughs> that won't work. All right, how many have a Bible? Hold your Bible up good and high. How many folks have a Bible? All right, great. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts with me, would you? And we're going to look at Acts chapter 26. The book of Acts in chapter 26. All right, this morning we're going to read a couple more verses than I normally do. And we talk about a subject this morning that I trust to be a blessing. I hope you have a paper piece of paper. I hope you have a pencil. I want you to take your Bible and underline a couple of things. And I want to be very, very practical today about a subject that I think we really, really as God's people need to not only see in the Bible, but ask God to work into our life. Stand with me, would you, for the reading of the Bible. And I'm going to start reading Acts chapter 26, and I'm going to start in verse 12. Now, a little word of history if I can. Paul had been arrested. Paul was a preacher. He preached the gospel, he preached plainly, but he'd been arrested. The first governor that, you know, brought him in and interviewed him and was called Felix, and his wife's name, Felix's wife, was Drusilla. And they brought Paul in often, and Paul would tell them, give his testimony. And the Bible says the reason that Felix brought him in often is what Felix was trying to do is get Paul to give him some money to buy his way out. So he was in jail. Well, two years went by, and another governor came in, and Festus came in. When Festus came in, Festus began to hear what Paul had to say. And he was arrested because he was preaching the gospel. And they didn't like what he was preaching. So he gave his testimony. And Festus kept him in jail. Then the king came to town. The king's name was Agrippa. When Agrippa came to town, he heard about this man who believed that a man had come from heaven, had been born of a virgin, had shed his blood, had paid the price for sin, had died, was crucified, witnesses knew he had died, but was raised from the dead by the power of God. Now, Agrippa never heard of the resurrection. So Agrippa called him and he said, well, I want to hear this for myself. So what you're going to read with me this morning is what Paul said to him. Let's look for just a minute at verse 12. We'll start reading chapter 26, verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, this is Paul talking to Agrippa, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven about the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them that journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying to me in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin, and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now the verse I want you to look at is verse 19. Whereupon, because of what I've just told you, because of what God has done in my life, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. Would you read those loud words aloud with me together? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now that sounds pretty good if this was, you know, a very high-class Anglican church. 
but it doesn't sound very good for a good Baptist church. So a little bit louder. You ready to go? Here we go. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Lord, we love you today. How our hearts have been stirred by the music, the fellowship that we've had. And God, I pray the word of God would become precious. And God, that you would hide it in our hearts today. And God, that you move upon us, that God, we could be what you want us to be. And God, I pray that one that's unsaved would be saved today. The one who's nearest to hell would come to Christ. And that God, people that are strayed would get back on the path. And you would deal with us, God, from the inside out. And we'll thank you for that first in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would. You know, in the testimony that Paul gave unto Agrippa, he's the only man that I've ever read about in the Bible that was saved and called to preach at exactly the same time. You say, what do you mean by that? What he told him, if you reread these verses very carefully, he said, Jesus appeared unto me. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed to be saved. But as soon as he said yes to Jesus, Jesus then began to deal with him, and he called him to preach. So here was a man way back out of some 26 years before he stood before King Agrippa, and he gave a testimony of how he'd been saved, gave a testimony of how God had called him to preach. He even gave him the intent in verse 19 to open their eyes. When I preach, I preach to open people's eyes. When I preach, I preach to turn them that from darkness to light. When I preach, I want the power of Satan to move them from Satan's power into God's power that they might receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And you know what? That's pretty good direction for preaching today. Don't you think so? And Paul said that's the way God had anointed him to preach the word of God. So here he is 20-some years later standing bound in jail before Agrippa giving this testimony. Now this was the deciding point in Paul's life. It was a point of decision. Verse 19, he said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now that verb tense on when he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, it just doesn't mean right now I'm looking back. It deals with the process. It's somewhat, it could be said somewhat like this, I became not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It means God gave me what to do 26 years ago. And when God gave me what to do 26 years ago, I've had a little trouble along the way. I've once in a while been tempted of Satan. I had to go 14 years on the backside of a desert and be without and be by myself. God had to instruct me through other people. So I've had to learn. I've had to suffer difficulty. I have been beat. I've been put in prison. I've had to almost be put aside as if I were dead. And God revived me and put me back. In other words, it's not an easy one-time statement. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What he was saying is, through these 20-some years since I've accepted Christ, God has moved upon my life, and I have grown to the point I have become not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It is a process. I say it's a decisive point in Paul's life because it defined his life. Back in the beginning, when God called him to preach, he committed to it. And he may have wafered a little bit. He may have gone off the path a little bit, but he came back. And his decision to not be disobedient to the heavenly vision, and ladies and gentlemen, it was not just a divisive and a decision point in his life, but it was for you also. Because in God's plan, if you read the New Testament, if it were not, humanly speaking, for the Apostle Paul, you and I would not have had somebody to take the gospel to the Gentiles. If it were not for the Apostle Paul, we would not have the epistles that we have in the New Testament today, humanly speaking. What I'm saying is, Paul made a decision that affected you. Just like when you make a decision, it affects your family. Just like when you make a decision, it affects your city. It affects people around you. It'll affect people should Jesus tarry his coming. It'll affect people till Jesus comes because your decision ripples down through the eons of time because your influence will never die. That's what Paul was saying. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I could title this differently. Je we put, Jennifer put the title up on it as I gave it to her. I said, I'm not really dealing with somebody going to heaven. What I'm dealing with, and she depicted it quite well on that graphic, I said, what I'm dealing with is somebody finishing right. Somebody finishing right. Look at that graphic for just a minute. 
And you've seen it. And I think of a guy that was running the mile in the Olympics. He tripped and fell, and he had to crawl, but he finished the finish line. And Christian, hear me today. It's important for you and I, I don't care what age you are, how long you've been saved, we need to make a decision that regardless of the cost, if we have to crawl, we're going to finish right. And if we don't finish right, what is it all about if we don't finish right? Now, we need to start right to finish right. I understand that. You cannot start right until you receive Christ as your Savior. You cannot start right until you can put your head on a pillar at night and know that should you die, you're going to heaven. You can't start right until you believe the Bible's the Word of God and you know that serving God is worth more than anything else on this earth. I don't think we can really start right until we understand that everything around us today is temporary. I mean, our homes are temporary. Our automobiles are temporary. You go back and study Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm going to do a whole year study on that next year and release a lot of it through devotional thoughts across the country and other places on the word faith. Because to be quite honest with you, most of the people that you have inherited your Christianity from, most of the people that you have inherited your salvation from, most of the people that you have inherited what you believe and what has changed your life and what's going to put you in heaven when you die are people who didn't own a house, who didn't have an automobile, who didn't have worldly goods. And they denounced worldly goods in order that they could finish the course right and be true to God when they had to make a choice they were going to put God before anything else in their life. They finished right. They determined they were going to finish right. Now, I've been preaching a long time. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people didn't finish right. How many people join me? You know, we see a lot of people don't finish right. And it breaks your heart. It really breaks your heart. I've got a partner and a minister in the Philippines that called me from Chicago weeping. Now, when he called, I thought he was in Manila, but he's in the Philippines. And when he called me from Chicago weeping, a problem that had come into his life, the first thing I did is get involved in his life and did the best I can to solve it. I'm glad to tell you he's got back on the track, but I'm going to tell you that's not always the case. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not just preachers that don't finish right. It's deacons that don't finish right also. Amen? And it's not just preachers and deacons that don't finish right. It's dads that don't finish right, that don't do right by their wife and don't do right by their children. And it's mothers that don't finish right. And young people, listen, if you're a save, you're a teenager, listen, that doesn't mean you can sow wild oats and one day you can just say, well, I'm 25, 26, I'll jump on everything's all right. It doesn't work that way. You have to make a commitment to God and live by that commitment and you be a line upon line and precept upon precept. We're not going to be perfect and you're going to fall and maybe you're in this auditorium today and you were right with God and you're not right with God today and your life is not in focus. There's an altar up here and you get on your knee one time and say, God, I want everything to be right and God will take you where you are and put you right back on the path. But we've got to determine we're going to finish right. So that phrase, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What is it dealing with? It's dealing with finishing right. I've tried to just meditate through a little bit and try to ask the question. Looking at it a little bit, what is it in life that takes you and me? What, what takes us off the course? Brother, what is it that's like a magnet trying to make me not finish right? What is it that Satan would like to do to make you not finish right? You that are maybe just been married. What is it that Satan would like to do to him? What, is he, what can he possibly do to wreck you as a husband and wreck you as a wife? Why is it we don't finish right? I think it's because we forget some very important things. I want you to write them down. Number one is this. I think one of the reasons we start right, have good intentions, we want to do right, we want to try to get through and you know, be everything we should be. One of the things is we forget our purpose. Just very simply, we forget our purpose. We forget our purpose. Now, can I remind you that you can go to a preacher and say, I've been saved. Now, what is my purpose in life? He can be a help. But you don't have to go to the preacher. You, you can go to a denomination 
and you can get some denomination heads and people that have graduated and got PhD degrees in theology and say, what do I have to do? What, is, what should be the plan of my life? What should be the purpose of my life? You don't have to do that. Because when you get saved, you get into a lordship relationship to Jesus Christ where Jesus becomes your master, he becomes your Lord. Then you need to look and see what has the master said is our purpose. What has Jesus said is our purpose? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You might come up to me today and say, Brother Wood, you know, this and that and the other. You might ask me, what is the main driving force in your life? And I'd like to tell you, and I hope it doesn't sound uh, too, you know, pious. I don't mean it to sound that way at all. But I've asked God to help me from day number one since I've been in the ministry. I've got off and got back on a little bit to work for one thing, and that is to get people saved. That's what I'm in business for. That's what I'm standing up here for. And I believe that's what this church is for. That's what God's left us here. Somebody said, well, I disagree. Well, that's your prerogative, but you'd have to have a big problem with the Bible. Because Jesus said about himself, the Son of Man is to come, say it aloud with me, to seek and to save that was the law. Now tell me, who did the saving? Who does the saving? Who pays the penalty for sin? Jesus did. Then what is our job? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save. We got a part in that. What is our job? To seek. We're supposed to be seeking out the lost while we build our families, while we do the rest of it. Let me show you what I mean for just a minute if I can. Brother, would you stand up for just a minute if you don't mind? Let me see. Brother, would you stand up? I'll pick on some people who won't get too mad at me here a little bit. And let's see. Well, I'm, uh, we just met, so I'm going to get you just now. I don't think you'd get too mad at me. There we go. All right, here we go. Now watch. You're a fireman. Okay? All three of you work for the fire department. Now, your, your job, <laughs> ladies visit our firehouse once in a while. They go upstairs and look at how awful we are at eating. We do. Your job is to keep the area we eat at clean upstairs. All right? Now, brother, when we slide down that pole, we got to get down fast because we got to get on the truck fast. Got to put the fire up. So your job is to keep that pole shiny so we can slide down fast. And, and, brother, your job is to make sure we don't run out of gas. You've got to keep gas and all. We've got to have a truck ready to go. So keep the truck maintenance. Now, what is your responsibility? Keep everything clean. Clean the pole. Keep the truck filled up. And they're all three wrong. <laughs> so well, what do you mean? <laughs> because I shifted words. Remember I said, your job. Then a minute ago, I said, now, what is your responsibility? What's the responsibility of a fireman? Put out a fire. Put out a fire. Put out a fire. Now, while your responsibility is to put a fire out, you got jobs to do. Correct? So we get jobs, but our response, if we forget our responsibility, you could clean up. The chief could say, go put the fire out. I wasn't hired to do that. I just keep the kitchen clean. Well, would you put the fire out? I wasn't hired to do that. I'm supposed to keep the pole shined. <laughs> well, we don't have one guy left. Would you put the fire? Can't do that. I was hired to put gas in the thing. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Be seated. Now, what's your responsibility? I'm talking to saved people. What's your responsibility? You say, well, I sing in the choir. Well, that's, you serve God doing that, but that's your job. I'm an usher. That's your job. I'm a deacon. Brother Arnold, I'm a deacon. That's your job. That's what we do. You know, I'm on the finance committee. I do this. I do it. There are 232 people in this ministry. That's the reason it's so progressive and doing as well as it is. There's 232 people in here that are part of the care team or they're part of something else. Or I mean, thank God for that service. That's their job. What is our responsibility? To win souls. Amen? When we just focus on our job and we forget our purpose, all of a sudden we get cold. And all of a sudden we get indifferent. And all of a sudden the things that motivated us to see people say, can I tell you something? There's nothing in a family like having a brand new baby. 
And there's nothing that helps the church anymore than every Sunday having brand new babies that are born into the family of God. Amen? Our job is to do what? We forget our purpose. And as soon as we forget our purpose, things go the wrong direction. We need to be the kind of people that will witness and do what we can to anyone, any place, any time. We ought to have gospel tracts. We ought to get trained in soul winning. We ought to know how to win people to Christ. We've got something to do. And all of a sudden, if we're not careful, I've got, I think it's 16 men. We just invited one other guy to get with us in our ministry. And what we do worldwide, that are on our board. And the main thing that I tell them when we meet is this. If in our ministry I start down any path that is not directed at getting people saved, say, David, you're off the path. We need to stay on the plan. We need to stay by the path. Amen? Why do we have life groups to get people saved? I went to Michigan, started a church, and I said, well, and we started up there, and I had a young guy, good-looking guy, like his, his son's over here. In fact, his older son reminds me of one of these guys, and he's, you know, just ready to go, big shoulders, ready to, you know, get it all done. And, and what is, I said, well, he said, we can't have a softball team. Why can't we have a softball team? Because if the goal of everything is to get people saved, you can't have a softball team. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, bring me the rules of the league. So he brought me the rules of the league, and I read them, and they looked pretty good. And I said, we're going to add two rules for our church. What's the two rules? You have to have 12 people on a softball team to fill a softball team. And you can go start a softball team. It's fine. In fact, I wish you'd start 10 because five of the 12 cannot be saved people, and they cannot be members of this church. He said, where are we going to get them? I said, I don't know. You're the one who wants a softball team. Not me. He said, what's rule number two? They can't play during the week unless they're in preaching Sunday morning. What was I after? Anybody got that figured out? They had five softball teams the first year. What's five times five? I had 25 people that those studs in church They played softball, brought in every Sunday to hear the gospel. You don't have to back up or stop things. In fact, when we get focused on winning people to Christ, it accelerates everything forward to the cause of Christ. After all, that's what Jesus came for. Amen? I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't finish right, we get so bogged down over on the side and bogged down over here that all of a sudden we're not putting the main thing, the main thing in our life. Why don't we finish right? Because we forget our purpose. Let me give you a second. Number two, we forget the identity of the enemy. We forget who the enemy is. I want you to think about who is our enemy. This is kind of a talk back to me kind of message a little bit. Who is our enemy? It's Satan. Now we know that. Amen? But we forget it. Fifty-five years. You think June and I have ever had a disagreement? You said that mighty quick. <laughs> I'll never forget, brother. I, I went up in Columbia. I finished Bible college. I was 19 years old when I got saved. I didn't know anything about the Bible when I got saved. I really didn't. I thought it was generations of revolutions. I didn't know. I was in Bible college in June, and I just got saved. I was kind of dumb. I mean, dumb and dumber sometimes, you know. And I was working and carrying a job. June was going to school. I was going to school. We was living on th- in a little apartment, $35 a month, concrete floor, nothing. Had a 1953 Chevrolet that I wish I had one today like that. Amen. I mean, everything's going good. I thought I owned the world. And we just wide open, you know, and going after this thing. And they asked me, <laughs> Brother Ken, they asked me to have a church over inside of Bethany Baptist Church. I want to know if I'd be an interim pastor. I said, what's an interim pastor? Never heard of that in my life. I said, does that mean I get to preach? They said, yeah. I said, I'll take it. They didn't have but about 17 people there. That didn't make it different to me. Didn't have but one. Sorry for me, I just wanted to preach. So I went over there, Bethany Baptist Church, interim pastor, and there was a man over in that church. I, I didn't know a thing about anything at all about church trouble, church problems, church anything. And so a man walked up to me. His name was Leo. I'm not going to give you his last name. I'll never forget him because a lot of these guys I met down through the years by a different name, same person. And Leo walked up to me and said, do you agree with our Constitution? I said, what is a Constitution? I mean, you're talking about, 
You can call it green, whatever you want to. All I want to do is preach. He said, well, it's it's how we do things. I said, is it by the Bible? He said, yeah. I said, I agree with it then. Never had read it. I said, I agree with it. He said, great. So I became the interim pastor. And we went to Leo's home one day. And June and I sat and invited us down to supper. Now I want you to know that Leo was the only deacon, the chairman of deacons, the Sunday school superintendent, the song leader. You want me to keep going? Everybody got the picture? Wave if you got the picture. I mean, I didn't even, I, I, saw, I knew so little about it, I didn't know what was happening. I was just out of preach. We sat in Leo's house, and, and so his wife cooked to me, and we were sitting there. He looked at me, he said, David, I've been married 35 years, and my wife and I have never had a disagreement. Now, I was 20-some years old. I haven't been saved very long. You'll have to forgive me because I didn't have the tact that I've got now. I don't have much now, but I had none then. Am I right, June? I mean zero. So Leo looked at me. He said, I've been married 30-some years. Me and my wife never had a disagreement. I said, Leo, one or two things is true then. What's that? Number one, you're either a liar or number two, you're the most henpecked man I've ever seen in my life. Amen. Did I tell him the truth? It may not be the way you ought to tell it, but at least I told the truth. What I'm trying to say is you, if you get married, you're going to have some problems, but your wife is not your enemy. Your husband's not your enemy. Are we listening? Teenagers, your parents, not your enemy. Amen? And listen for just a minute. Hey, another preacher's not my enemy. And we have problems within our church. And this church has gone through a problem that would sink a lot of people that you have weathered tremendously. But I want you to know, nobody in human flesh is the enemy of this church. It is the devil that's the enemy of this church. It's the devil that wants to bring this church down. It's the devil that wants to make you quit. It's the devil that wants to make you fight one another. It's the devil that wants you to gossip. It's the devil that wants to destroy things. It's not human flesh. It's the devil that's our enemy. Let's recognize that. If you don't, you're going to fight the wrong battle. You'll be fighting your wife. Kids, you'll be fighting your parents. That's what's happening in America now. we got fight, 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 where we've gotten off the basis of understanding what the reality of things really are all about. I want you to listen for a minute. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul said, Satan hindered me. He could have put a personality to it. He could have called the name of the man who hindered him. He didn't. He said, Satan has hindered me. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus gave you a preview of what Satan does. Jesus said, for the thief cometh not, but to do what? Somebody tell me aloud. What's the thief come from? He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's progressive. You know what Satan wants to do to Countryside Baptist Church? If you hadn't had a problem, he still wanted to do it. It doesn't make any difference. If you just get married, he wants to do it. If you've been married numbers of years, he wants to do it. First thing he wants to do is steal something from you. He wants to steal the power of a church. He wants to steal the love out of a family. He wants to steal the things that binds things together that give you the kind of relationship you ought to have. That's the first thing he wants. He wants to steal something. As soon as you let him steal something, you say, well, it's not too awful bad. Yes, it is, because he begins then to kill something. It's step number two. He steals and then he kills. And if you let him begin to kill something, he begins to clap because he knows step number three is around the corner, which is to utterly destroy you. He wants to destroy, teenager, your life. He wants to destroy your future. He wants to destroy your marriage. Satan wants to destroy this church. Satan wants to destroy all that we're doing to get the gospel out worldwide. The answer is, are we going to finish right? Are we going to come through it and put our confidence in Christ? Are we going to be willing to say with Paul, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. I want to tell you, you've got to have backbone to say that. And you've got to have stick to itness. And you've got to keep everything right with God. Once in a while, we've got to look at somebody and say, I have been wrong, forgive me. Once in a while, we've got to ask God to forgive us. But thank God, I want to tell you, it's worth it. It is worth it when you finish right. It's worth it when you finish right. Number three, 
I don't have a lot of time. I've got to move on fast. But number one, I hope you write these down. Number one, why don't we finish right? We started right. You remember when you had that great desire to do something great for God? You remember when you had a great desire for your family, for your family to be a great Christian home? You remember when that baby was first born? And you looked in the window and said, is that really mine? And you see all these people talking about how pretty babies are. And I don't want to get off on that one. I'll have half the ladies in church mad at me right now. I'll leave that one alone. But a newborn baby, that's the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Really? And you begin to look at this, and you've got a brand new baby. But I want to tell you, as soon as you get a brand new baby, am I right or wrong here? Husband and wife, am I right or wrong? I'm going to tell you, when God gives you a child, it changes things. Am I right or wrong? Amen? It changes things. That child can, one breath, and your whole life has changed. And you know what? You had a desire to do something great. You had a desire to be the right dad, to be the right. What has happened? I want to tell you, you can come right back on that path through the grace of God. But what has happened to us? We don't finish right. You in business, I don't care about this business, what it is, we got goals, we got dreams, that's a good thing. We want to get something done for God, that's a good thing. We want to double attendance, that's a good thing. We want to have 100 teenagers, that's a good thing. We want to try to get people saved every Sunday, the baptism water stirred every week, that's a good thing. But listen, all of a sudden, those dreams are laid aside. And we get mediocrity that comes in. And we get settled to it. And we settle for mediocrity. Why don't somebody just get tired of settling for mediocrity and say it like Zig Ziglar said it years ago. He said, I'm just tired of getting tired. And I feel the same way sometimes, don't you? We as God's people have got to get to the point that we put the things of God first, regardless of the cause. But we forget our purpose. We forget who our enemy is. Let me tell you something else we get. Oh, how we forget this. We forget the power of an almighty God. Wow. Who saved you? Did the Baptist church save you? <laughs> Baptism water wash your sin away? Did church liturgy save you? Did the ordinance of the church save you? You know what? It's an all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all wise, and I could keep on all day about the magnitude of our wonderful God. That's the God that saves you. The same God that says, you can't think like I think. You can't understand like I understand. How can we ever understand eternity? You can't. I've often said that if I could take you by the hand and take you back to Genesis when God created and we could stand back at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and look before things were created and it was like a ledge you could jump off of. We hold hands together and we jump off. You know where we would land? In eternity. Because God is an eternal being. He existed before this earth was here. He existed before the universe was in place. He's got a solar system that no astronaut can understand. He's got galaxies out there that are bigger. In fact, they don't even know how many galaxies God's put out there. I want to tell you, you've got an almighty God that no human mind, that no human being will ever understand. And back before this earth came into being, that was eternity. But wait a minute. If I took you by the hand and we walked forward to the book of Revelation, and we got in Revelation and we at that point where the Bible says time shall be no more. Have you ever thought about this? God's the one that started time. There was no time. There is no time with God. God did it for the earth. He started time. He created in Revelation. He said times will be no more. That's the end of time. You and I jump off right there. We land in eternity. We land in exactly the same spot that we landed in where we jumped off thousands of years ago. Thousands of us, nothing with God. He said, I am. And you say, why is that important to me? Because when you got saved, now hold on to your seat. When you got saved, you didn't get time life. You got eternal life from an eternal, almighty, powerful God. And we forget that God. When we forget that God, we don't finish right. We forget the power of God and what God can do in our life. My, what a difference is when we think about it. I was studying this last week in the model of prayer where God taught us to pray. Have you ever noticed that it starts out by praise to God, ends up by praise to God? 
Thy kingdom come. Our Father which art in heaven, it praises God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It starts, stops by praising God. And we look at that model prayer. And you know, I want to tell you, I believe with all of my heart, the reason for that is God wants us to keep our attention on the fact that if you need a job, you've got an almighty powerful God that can give you a job. If you need healing in your home, you've got an almighty powerful God that can give you healing in your home. If you want to be a soul winner and be consistent in doing it, you've got an almighty powerful God that can give you the consistency to serve Him. If you've got a problem in your life and you've been trying everything the world has to offer to give you the difference in it and it's not working, listen, why don't you turn to God and let God, who is the originator of everything, God who is the creator of everything, God who can make everything to happen, let God do it in your life. Then you walk around and be like that maniac at Gadaree. I kind of like the people Jesus dealt with. Maniac. That, pretty, that describes a lot of people in this church, doesn't it? I'm not going to say who, but you know. <laughs> now think about it for just a minute. Here this guy's a maniac. He gets saved. And the first thing God told him to do was what? I want you to sit on the front row of the Baptist church. I want you to study doctrine when you've learned a lot of doctrine. Eventually after two and a half years and you pass the course and you get everything right, then I'm going to send you out and let you tell people about Jesus. No. As soon as he got saved, he said, I'll tell you what you need to do. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you. Can I talk to you from my heart at this minute? One of the greatest problems most of us in this room have is we've been saved too long. <laughs> what do you mean? We've been saved too long. You've, you, you've been saved so long you got over it. When you first get saved, how many of you remember when you first got saved? I mean, you first get saved. It's exciting, isn't it, brother? And then you run against a Christian and says, you'll get over it. Don't you? I don't want to say hate, so don't you dislike those people? When I passed the second church, I passed in Grand Rapids. We had, at the end of two years, we had 190 people that had been trained in soul winning. We had 90 teams a week of winning people to Christ, and so we had people every Sunday down the aisles, and, and people were coming to Christ, and, and every once in a while, to keep this point alive. I say, everybody's been saved six months or, or let's try that. Anybody in here today has been saved six months or less, would you stand? You've been saved six months or less, would you stand? Well, we've had some people through this ministry who've been saved six months or less, but they're not here. So we'd have a number of people to stand. I say, do me a favor. Don't let these other, stay away from these other people over there. They pour cold water on your Christianity. What was I trying to say? Wonderful people. And that's what this auditorium is filled with, wonderful people. But if we're not careful, folks, somebody just gets saved, they are enthusiastic. Should we be enthusiastic? They believe God can do anything. Should we believe God can do anything? They believe that God can make a difference in their life. Should we believe that God continually can make a difference in our life? The problem is we get over it. Maybe I'm going to bring a message one time on how not to get over your Christianity. Because <laughs> that's what we do sometimes. We get over it. And all of a sudden, we're not amazed anymore by the things that should happen in our life. We forget we have an almighty, powerful God that can do anything whatsoever that happens in our life. And I'm going to give you one other thing because I believe this with all of my heart. I believe one of the main reasons that we don't finish right, not only we forget our purpose, not only we forget who our enemy is, not only do we forget the character and the disposition of an almighty, all-powerful, holy God, but we forget a fundamental of the Bible. The reality of a real hell. We forget there is a hell. A hell that's burning this morning. Somebody, I don't know who it was, Somebody within 15 miles of this church died this last week without Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, we sit here with our suits and ties on, and we sit here with our, you know, try to be, as, and we should, this is good. But that person that died without Christ is screaming in hell right now while you're sitting here. And they were Last week, 15 miles from where we are. You say, 
Is that my responsibility? What's the answer to that? Yes. Should I care? You say it's too heavy a load. Not if you go at it one by one. Not if we're not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You cannot do everything, but you can do something. Sometimes we walk down the seaside, and we're with this guy, and we talk about, wow, look at the starfish. These starfish is just thousands of starfish. Some of you have seen them where the tide rolls them up on the edge of the sand. Thousands of starfish. And you reach down, and you pick one up and throw it back out in the water. And the guy with you says, I don't know why you do that. It's thousands here. You can't make a difference to those. You need to look back at him and say, it makes a difference to the one I picked up and threw back in. You may have, can only reach one person in your entire life, but I want to tell you, your life will be worth it if you reach one. Could I get an amen on that? If you just reach one. We do everything we can to keep our focus on. Now turn in your Bibles. Let's read a couple of verses together. I won't be much longer, honestly. I know I preached about four messages here. We'll keep going another one or two and we'll quit. All right, look with me for just a minute if you would. And I want you to look back at a couple of verses with me. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Because this man we're talking about, this man we're talking about, the Apostle Paul, he not only testified in the book of Acts about the salvation and the way that God had worked in his life, but look with me if, would, if you would for just a minute. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Some of you that were in our, our life groups, remember we used this verse one of our lessons, maybe six, seven weeks ago. Look at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire is to have a new car. My heart's desire is to get out of debt, which is a good thing to want to do. But you can put anything you want to in there. My heart's desire is this. Or if I can just reach retirement age, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is what? Somebody tell me what it is. That they might be saved. Wouldn't it be a good thing if our altar was lined by people to say my heart's desire for this entire county is that everybody in this county could be saved? Would that be a good thing? You say, well, it's an unreasonable thing to pray. Paul didn't think so. The whole nation of Israel. It would have been harder for him to reach the nation of Israel in his day when it would for us to reach this whole county. My heart's desire to Israel. Now turn back to chapter 9. Look at chapter 9 for just a minute. He said, I want to say something to you. He didn't really mean it. Paul was just preaching. Really? Look at verse 1 in chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ. Watch how many times he guarantees you he's going to tell you something. You can really believe he means it. I'm not lying to you. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience, what's inside of me that witnesses to God, it also bears me witness. And then he calls as his proof text the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have. That word have is a continual. Every minute that he's awake is a burden. It doesn't mean he didn't tell a joke. It doesn't mean he didn't laugh. It doesn't mean he might not have had a couple of activities. It meant the main pressing thing on his heart was to follow. What is it, Paul? That I have a great heaven as a continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. That's that nation of Israel again. My kinsmen according to the flesh. You know what Paul was saying right there? Paul was saying this. I know there's a heaven. And I know that God saved me and I can go to that heaven. I know there's a hell. And I'm the same one that said to be absent from the body is to be present with God. But I want to tell you, the burden that I have for the nation of Israel, if God would let me go to hell, and I could be in hell forever, and I could never escape hell, could never get out of hell, and that would be my abiding place forever to be in hell. But the result would be that Israel would be saved. He said, God, put me in hell. Whoa. For instance, suppose I'm standing here this morning preaching, getting near the end of the service, and all of a sudden, whoo, an angel, a representative of heaven, an angel, God sent me looking for someone. Well, I think I'd stand aside and say, well, the floor is yours. 
who did God send you looking for? God said He'd like for everybody in this county to be saved. Everybody to know Christ as Savior. He said, then God expanded it and He said, He'd like everybody in the state of Georgia saved. Wow. And He'd like everybody in the USA to be saved. And God said, He Himself will intervene and save every one of those people and they won't have to go to hell if one person in this congregation would stand and volunteer to go to hell at 12 noon today. Would you stand? Paul jumped up. I'm ready. If Israel would be saved, God, put me in hell. I'm ready. Do you have that kind of belief in hell? Do you have the kind of belief that in Luke chapter 16 that says there's fire in hell? Do you have the kind of belief in hell that says that the rich man died? Watch. They didn't even have to bury him. As soon as he was pronounced dead, he was awake in hell and in the fires of hell. And you remember the pleading that he did. I am tormented in this place. He began to speak to Father Abraham, send somebody back to my brother. Send somebody back to somebody else. I believe with all of my heart the time is going to come when we're going to stand in the presence of God in heaven. We're going to plead and say, God, I wish I had a did what I could to win my family. Did what I could to win somebody else. Now let me tell you the problem with not doing these things. And then I'm finished. You say, well, why should I not forget my purpose? Because as soon as we forget our purpose, you know what happens to us? We lose our vision. Once you forget your purpose, you lose your vision, you lose the focus. You say, why should I not forget that Satan is really my enemy? Because as soon as you forget that Satan's your enemy, you fight the wrong battles. You're going to be fighting wrong battles your whole life. Why should I be afraid to forget the magnitude of God? Now watch this. Because as soon as we forget that God is an almighty, all-powerful God, you know what we do? All of a sudden, we put our confidence in ourselves and the arm of the flesh. And in America today, in all socialistic countries, we believe the government is our supply and our God and not God Almighty. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you God is bigger than any government upon this earth. I want to tell you that God can take care of anything that ever exists in our life. He is big enough to take care of it. He said, if you need it, ask me for it, I'll take care of it. Wow, what a God we serve. Now watch this. As soon as we forget, as soon as we forget, are you listening? As soon as we forget there's a hell, we invest our life in lesser things. Our time, our money, our energy, and lesser things. Godner and Alice Gentry lived in Louisville, Kentucky. Godner Gentry began to study under Wally Beebe how to run a successful bus ministry. He went to his pastor, who is tremendous Tom Wallace, who pastored Beth Haven Baptist Church outside of Louisville on the loop around Louisville, Kentucky. And he said, I know you're for soul winning. I know you want to get as many people saved as possible. I want to become the bus director. God the Gentry started with one bus and built up to where he had 40 buses. His wife, Alice, is one of the most dignified ladies, one of the most well-dressed ladies, carries herself. She could be a governor's wife. She could be a president's wife. I mean, a dignified lady. And they go out and knock on trailer doors and beg kids to come. God the Gentry developed a plan where the bus ministry could pay for itself. And Beth Haven Baptist Church, in five years, had over 15,000 children saved because of the ministry of God and the Gentry. God and the Gentry had his heart touched by God to go to a country in Africa, a country in Africa that's the fifth poorest country, right below Kenya, a country that I visited twice. They're so poor in that country that they only have one structure that you call a hotel in the whole country that you could stay in. No air condition, no heat. They're so poor, they only eat one meal a day. 
I asked one of the mothers when I was there, I said, you only eat one meal a day. Yeah, and they're so happy. They smile. They're excited. They're Christians. They love God. What meal do you eat? And she looked at me and said, Brother David, everybody in that country would call me, Brother David said, I feed them when the sun's going down so they won't be hungry at night so they can go to sleep. They have no economy. That's how poor they are. It's not how much an hour does the average person make. No, no. They have to dig. And you don't want to know what they dig out of the ground to eat. When I'm preaching, they, they have moths that fly around about this big, look like a locust that are green. I'm not trying to make you sick or anything. I'm trying to just tell you what that's like. I'm preaching, and one of them is buzzing around. It's snatch, eat. They eat anything they can get. Fifth, fourth country. I'm going to gross you a little bit more. I'm doing this on purpose. They have no toilet paper. They use rocks. They take your rocks down the stream and wash them off and use them over. I could keep going. They are poor, poor people. God in the gentry went to his wife Alice and said, Alice, we don't have but about maybe 15 more years to go. And That country, let's go to that country. And let's live there and reach those people for Jesus Christ. And that dignified couple moved to that country. This was about 21 years ago. We have been able, under his leadership there, and you've helped some with your support through the Witness Project, we have been able to train over 700 national pastors in that country that's on the east coast of Africa. They have built, to our knowledge now, little old, I mean, not churches with walls on them, but they draw a circle in the dirt. And they meet over 600 churches are in that country today. They go down to the river that is so dirty you wouldn't want to get in it. That's where they baptize after people have been saved. I went to see their clinic. The clinic is nothing but unpainted blocks. One room with a dirt floor. The waiting room, and it's about 100 to 105 degrees. The waiting room is a Dirt out in front of one door that enters into that room. Nothing on the dirt, but just a little strip of white cloth and people laying there with their arms infected and their heads blown up and their bodies distorted, waiting, hoping somebody can take them through that little room door and maybe give them some kind of medical condition. And I must confess to you, that doesn't change my life as much as it ought to. I'll confess something else to you. I believe with all of my heart we're not going to finish right. I'm not going to finish right. And you're not going to finish right. Nobody's going to finish right until we determine one day at a time we're not going to be disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, our invitation will be different this morning. I want our pianist to slip up as she would to the piano if you don't mind because I want you to start playing in just a minute. And when she starts playing, we're going to stand. I'm going to ask you to join me if you'd like to. You don't have to. This is not good, better, and best Christians. You might want to do it at your seat, but I'm going to ask you if many of you would do it, if God will let you do it, I'm going to ask you to come find a place at this altar and get on your knee. And I'm talking about Countryside Baptist Church. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your generations to come. I'm talking about this county. Folks, if we don't mean business with God, all we're doing is playing about this business of church. And the difference is, O oh king, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I don't believe there's a person in this room who doesn't want to stand before Jesus Christ one day and hear that, well done, thy good and faithful servant. It's all going to depend on what we determine today. It's not going to happen later. It's the day by day. We're not going to be disobedient to the heavenly vision. If God's touched your heart to pray that prayer to God, and then whatever God leads with your heart to do, whatever God may want you to do, little about it, don't worry about it. God can control and God can move in your life in whatever speed He wants to. But it starts by us saying, God, you're in control. Begin playing if you would right now. <laughs> 